professor of psychology at Brooklyn College in the Graduate Center of um, the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. She did her PhD in developmental psych and statistics from Boston College, and her research focuses on two things: emotion regulation in the arts in children and adults, and secondly, uh, cognitive and perceptual processes underlying graphic representation skill in artistically gifted children. She's funded by National Endowment of the Arts, the Imagination Institute, that's got to be a cool place to have a grant from, um, by the John T Templeton Foundation, and also PSC CUNY. Um, her research has been featured in Scientific American Mind, The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, and National Pro Public Radio. So uh, today, Jennifer's going to be speaking on Precocious Realist, the Cognitive and Perceptual Skills Underlying Artistic Genius in Children. So thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. Well, um, thank you all for coming and for having me. And feel free to ask questions um, during the talk if you have any, any clarification. Um, and so I'll be talking about precocious realists, and this is an example of um, a child, Joel, um, who is considered a, what I would consider a precocious realist. And so what I'm, how I'm defining this is these are children who are able to draw um, hyper-realistically years beyond um, their peers. Um, and so to draw realistically is a difficult task. And as artists, um, they have to draw what they see, not necessarily what they know. So I have these two plates here, and we can, you know, a dinner plate, um, we know that it is a round circle, and if we took an aerial shot of that, we also see it as a round circle. Um, but if we have a dinner plate on our table or in our cupboard, um, it actually is an, an ellipse. Um, so we have to, when we're drawing, to really capture um, the object, we really have to overcome our schema of this round plate and really draw the ellipse shape. Now, drawing requires um, many things. It requires um, envisioning, planning, translating. So we must take what's in our um, three-dimensional world and translate it onto a two-dimensional surface. Um, and because we have you know, small pieces of paper, or even you know, if you have paper the size of that table, you can't actually capture everything in our visual world. So it does require abstraction. So we have to focus on what details we want to convey in our drawing. Um, and in, because of that, it does require some type of visual analysis. We have to visually analyze what we're going to be drawing. And of course, it requires um, some type of motor scale or motor control. So I'm going to just start off showing you what typical children draw. And I, this is part I actually really enjoy, is showing you what typical children draw. So at between 18 months and two and a half years, children typically engage in scribbling. Um, it was once thought that children you know, like that motor action. And there was a, a study done uh, many years ago where they gave children um, a pen with, that did not have any lead in it to see if it was just that motor action. Um, and children actually, indeed, they stopped. They, didn't, they like making marks on the page. So it's not just that motor control. They do like having that, those images there. Um, so children start off after about two years. They start off doing what's called action representation. Um, so I have these words here. But what, uh, children, as they are drawing this, it's a man flying. And then we say, it's running away. So children kind of have just these lines to indicate some action. Um, here's another example. It's a rabbit. Hop, 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 hop. Um, and so you don't really know what the child is drawing um, until they've actually indicated or told you that you know this is a rabbit that's hopping. And so it's almost indicating some type of um, symbolic play. Um, around age three, <laughs> children start doing um, graphic representation. So this is the hallmark of children's drawings. This is the tadpole drawing. Um, it's universal. All children engage in this um, tadpole drawing. It's pretty universal across cultures. Um, so it's this kind of, it doesn't look realistic at all. It's just this body, not differentiating the head and the body, kind of maybe some limbs, um, but not realistic at all. And then around age four, um, children start to differentiate um, the head and the body, even drawing maybe some of the, the extremities. Now, individual differences in drawing can be found quite early. So this is um, Peter, age four, um, and what's remarkable are these, these differences are found without any drawing instruction. Um, so these children are showing these abilities at a very early age, um, and this would be an example of a precocious realist. A child is able to draw realistically um, well beyond their peer. Um, so just before getting into the research, I just want to talk about what are some of the characteristics of um, precocious realist drawing. Um, this is one of my favorites um, by Arkin, age four. Um, so you can see a lot of detail, um, you know, there's uh, occlusion, so there's this dinosaur behind this other dinosaur, which is very hard for um, preteens to do, let alone a four-year-old, um, and you even have this little dark dinosaur here, snarling, so it's like a little bit of, uh, I think, kind of like 
character, and he's a little feisty here. Um, so being able to create this is, is quite remarkable. So one of the characteristics is um, me being able to draw recognizable shapes. So a typical child around the age of two, they draw two slashes, is that action representation, draw two slashes, and they say, okay, this is standing for apple. Um, in contrast, the precocious realist is able to draw the contour, the contour, the overall shape of the, the apple, and you clearly know without even that you, them telling you that this is indeed an apple. Um, here's to another example, a typical child, again, that very cute tadpole drawing, um, completely out of proportion, and then we have Grace um, at age three, so able to capture proportions, details, um, this is an error, but she's actually trying to capture like the little leg of a um, the woman here kind of kicking up, so it's somewhat playful. Um, having the connection of the two two children here, or the two people here dancing. Um, here's another example. Of, I really like this one, but it's, you know, it's adorable, but it is, you know, it's not in proportion. So here you have H5. These are actually sisters who are able to create the proportions um, of the, uh, the animals. Um, and you can clearly tell that they have the, the overall shape of the of the animals too. Uh, and here's another example. So a typical child age 11, and then this is Jared age um, 12. And I think it almost looks like, you know, this is you know still life, but it almost looks like it's a picture of you know an apple and, and some type of goal. Um, details are another kind of characteristic. So this is um, Rocco at age five. Um, and so he was very interested, it's, it's, it's really remarkable because they become very interested in certain types of things. So he would go, he lives in rural Pennsylvania, so he would go out into his um, backyard and collect, I'm sure his mom loved this, but he would collect, you know, bugs and crickets and, you know, and leaves and stuff and kind of document his um, specimens. And so here you can see um, just incredible amount of details. There's shading here, you know, have the, the little things even how he's done the kind of the legs, having them with different angles instead of just sticking out. So it's a lot of detail here. Um, this is Reese, age five. So he is from um, Malaysia and is really interested in temples. So that's something that he's kind of fixated on. Um, this is um, not nine, about four and a half years later. This is something he drew um, in two hours, which I just kind of unbelievable. Um, and so he's really it was inspired by the movie Kung Fu Panda. So this is kind of a scene from that, from that movie. Um, and this is just to give you another sample. This is um, Arkin. He drew that dinosaur a couple of slides ago. So here he has you know, this creature, and you have the, you know, the, the, um, g the gills, the fangs, you know, the bones. So there's an incredible amount of um, detail here. So the, the lower one is uh, the skeleton? Yes, the skeleton. Whoa. Yeah, right? I know. Um, so how does he know that? Or is he looking <laughs> at a... How, is so he looking at any at a in some cases? So in some cases, it's from their imagination. Sometimes, uh, for in this case, I I, I know this child. Um, we have a Facebook page for gifted children that I so some of these drawings are taken from that. Um, but he likes to go to like different museums with his dad. So he like for the dinosaurs, he went to a dinosaur exhibit and then started drawing them at home. Um, I think for this one, this might have been from a you know looking at a textbook maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but for the dinosaurs, he actually saw the dinosaurs and then came home and drew them. Wow. Um, and then finally, another kind of characteristic is techniques to represent depth. So this is um, occlusion. So here um, you see this kind of front dinosaur kind of stampeding forward. The horn is drawn like on top of this dinosaur. His um, mouth is behind, I don't know what this is, but like his, <laughs> not ear, but this piece here, his leg is behind this other leg. So it's able to create depth, and what you see a lot with typical children is they just draw the line right over. They don't understand that you know it's behind, um, it's, and it's difficult for them to understand. Is that that plate that those those? Oh, that's what it is. The plate. Yeah. Yes. So plate. Plate. Yeah. yeah. Like teeth are behind the plate. Thank right. you. Um, another is juxtaposition. So this is a two-year-old, but what we have here in order to create depth, we have the top of the um, bicycle, and then he also creates kind of the the side and the bottom in order to just not having the circle, but actually to create some depth. Um, and then finally, um, perspective. So this is um, so this is the same child, age three and age six. Um, so create, using perspective to create um, depth. Typical children don't really show perspective until about age 13, 14. Um, so this is pretty remarkable that he's having such an, a young age. Um, and finally, foreshortening. That's another technique. 
and so this is drawing something shorter than it actually is to create some depth. So here, having the cheerleader um, almost as she's bending over to kind of shorten the torso, uh, torso, and so that's very hard for um, for children to understand. So this is um, age seven. This child was able to do this. And so the question is, what could make this precision, poss uh, precision possible? And so it's, um, po one possible explanation um, is that these children have what's called superior local processing. Um, and so they can focus on the details, um, not the whole. And so focusing on the details, they can really overcome the scheme of you know, what a table looks like or what a plate looks like, and really focus on honing on those details to create an, um, an accurate or highly realistic um, drawing. And this has been studied a lot in the autism li literature. So this is um, a drawing by E.C. He's an autistic savant that was studied by um, Motron and Bellevue in the 90s. Um, and they gave him a bunch of perceptual tasks that he did excel at. But what they were really interested in is he drew this, and they analyzed how he drew it. Um, and what you find in, in typical individuals and in artists, we you know, tend to draw the overall shape, and then we fill in the details. So we kind of have an overall, you know, this is the overall shape, and then we can add pieces. And what they found with um, EC is that he just drew kind of part by part. He would start off randomly somewhere, and you really didn't know where he was going because he would just kind of connect the lines. Um, and it wasn't until the drawing was completed that you actually knew what he was what he was drawing. So again, focusing on the details and not really the whole. Um, Stephen Wilshire is a more recent example. So he is also um, a an artist um, living in the UK. Also has autism, and so this is a um, a panoramic. Um, view of the New York City skyline. So he came to New York and then went up, uh, went up in a helicopter and he'd only seen the, the skyline for once. And then he came um, back to this art studio in New York City and drew this entire skyline from memory. Um, and it, you, you could tell, yeah, you could go to his website, his drawings are highly realistic and extreme amounts of detail. Um, and this is also the local processing has been studied in the visual spatial do domain, so it's the block design task is where it's been shown the most. Um, and so in this, uh, this is a study with children, and so uh, they're presented with a unsegmented image uh, that's made up of four blocks. And then they're presented, um, they're given four blocks, and these are representing each side of the block. Um, and so the children have to be able to mentally segment this image into its parts in order to find and like recreate the image. So here they would have to have all four of their blocks facing to this side and then kind of rearrange them. So here you have to be able to mentally segment the image and then they complete it in segmented form where the parts are already revealed. And so this one is considered much easier. So this one may be a little bit easier, um, but here's a more difficult one. So here again, they have to mentally segment this image first um, in order to complete it and they have to have these four pieces here. Um, and then so they do a series of unsegmented and then they do a series of um, segmented where the parts are revealed. And what's been shown is that if you look at, so this is unsegmented and segmented, and this is the time taken to complete the, um, the image or complete the design, and so higher would be it took longer. Um, for non-autistic uh, children, they're actually helped by segmentation. So they're much quicker when the images are segmented. Um, but for auti autistic uh, children, they actually perform very similar. Um, so they, they can kind of spontaneously mentally segment on this on their own, and they don't, they're not really helped by um, segmentation. Um, this has been shown with even more difficult tasks with adults. So again, this is the unsegmented version, and they're presented with, um, this is made up of nine blocks, so they're presented with uh, blocks, nine blocks that have these six sides, and they have to be able to mentally segment the image into its parts. Um, much easier when it's in the segmented version. Um, and what you find is for the segmented version, adults um, with and without autism perform equally as well. However, when you have this more difficult version, those with the adults with autism um, outperform the non-autistic um, adults. So they're doing really well at this. This has also been shown with the um, embedded figures test. So let's see if you can find this. But um, they're, they're given a complex shape, and they have to find this hidden figure here. Um, and so they have to find it here. Um, and then for down here, um, they would have to have find this right over here and kind of copy it here. So again, they have to, even with the shading, it's a little bit distracting, and I know some people sometimes think it's, it's down here, this image, um, but again, you have to avoid um, the overall whole and really focus on the context. And again, they find um, what's been found is that autistic children perform better than non-autistic children. Um, and then finally, this has also been shown not just in perceptual tasks, but on, on drawing tasks. So in this one, um, adults were presented with a, um, images, line images of different objects. 
uh, and they were asked to copy the images. And uh, Motron and colleagues looked at how did they copy these images. Did they first rely on a global strategy where they drew the overall shape and added details? Um, or did they use a local strategy like EC, where they kind of focused on the individual pieces and then drew the overall shape? And again, adults with, um, with autism, they copy more local fe features at the start of their drawing, um, suggesting that using a more local strategy. So this leads me to my, um, some of the work that I've done. So I was interested in whether precocious realists also have this um, perceptual um, or local processing ability. So do they share traits and behaviors with um, children with autism? Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about drawing prodigies and what the characteristics of drawing prodigies are. And then looking at child ar artists, whether they draw realistically or abstractly. So there are some um, child artists that are having exhibits that are these are being kind of um, advertised as being abstract expressionist um, artists. So what is a gifted child versus a prodigy? It really is um, a matter of degrees. So we can think of drawing as kind of this bell-shaped curve. It's this drawing. Um, it's a continuum. Um, both are at the higher end of, 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 the, of the curve. Um, but what seems to differentiate a gifted child versus a prodigy, they're both performing at an adult-like level, um, but for the prodigy, they have called what's, what's called a rage to master. And so this is this intrinsic motivation to um, engage in drawing at whatever, at whatever cost. So they would want to do it anytime, any place, anywhere. They don't want to, they can't be pulled away to go to school. They don't want to eat. They don't want to sleep. They just want to draw all the time. Um, and so this is an example of, um, I would think a rage to, I would consider a rage to master. So this is a child who went to dinner with his family. This is the placemat. And every square inch of um, space that he could, he drew um, all over this. And so there's parents who report their children just drawing all the time. You know, they're angry when they can't draw. Um, they just really enjoy it. So that's kind of the difference between a prodigy and a child. Okay, so do precocious realists have these um, superior local processing abilities? So this is work that I did um, at Boston College when I was a graduate student working with um, 27 non-ASD um, children, um, 9 boys, 18 girls. And again, interested in whether they have behaviors and traits that are similar to um, those children with autism. Um, so first to assess their drawing abilities, we gave them an observational drawing test. So this is a picture here. Um, of the actual still life. So it's a corkscrew. Um, so there's a lot of pieces, a lot of gears that they had to draw. Um, this base here um, is made up of six independent uh, individual cylinders. So there's a front row and a back row that they have to draw. And then they were given kind of this organic stock of leaves. Um, and so we gave them 15 minutes. We told them just draw what you see. Um, and then we measured um, or we scored the drawings for um, items that I described earlier that are found in gifted children's drawings. So for short need, so this corkscrew on its side is much shorter than what it, what it is standing up. Um, details, so drawing an organic shaped leaf, not just that stereotypical leaf, so they're really, were they really looking at um, the still life. Um, occlusion, so here I'm drawing this back row. Um, you'll see in a moment, sometimes they just drew them all in a row, the, the um, individual cylinders. Um, and then line is edge is that idea of the slash for the apple. So for the stem, did they just draw a line or did they draw you know, the right and the left side um, of the stem? And so we gave them a, a score anywhere from 0 to 100%. So 100% would be they had all of these features present um, in their drawing. Okay, so here's two six-year-olds. So this is an example. Um, they didn't have any features, but you can see they didn't understand, you know, not understanding that the front row is behind the back, so just drawing them all straight. All, um, not even connected, but just kind of all in a row. Um, and this is a child, six-year-old, that still had about, you know, two-thirds of the features. So here, um, I don't know if you can see, but you can, uh, they were able to capture that back row behind the front row. So there is um, evidence of occlusion. Um, and then here, for the gears, um, sometimes what, the, the gears, if you actually looked at them, were square or rounded square. And sometimes children would just draw, like, circles or, like, triangles even. And so this is a really good evidence here of um, this kind of rounded square shape here. Um, and then we have two nine-year-olds. So here's, um, you know, a third of the features. Um, and then this one had all of the features. And this is a really nice example of foreshortening. Um, so getting this, this middle piece much shorter than it actually actually is. So we looked at first, um, we we're interested in what predicts um, the, these abilities on these drawing, um, or these local processing tasks. So we did measure IQ to just kind of rule that out. Um, so they were given a verbal IQ test, a vocabulary where they presented pictures and had a state within the picture. 
and then um, definitions with a clue, so something to do with research, and they had to say um, experiment. Um, and then they were given a nonverbal IQ test, and this is the one of the samples. It's much easier. They get very complex as you go on, but the child had to understand that a hack was on a head, and the foot goes on a, or I'm sorry, a shoe goes on a foot. So they had to understand those um, relationships. So we found that um, drawing talent is not explained by IQ. It was not related to nonverbal or verbal IQ. Um, we gave them these block the block design tasks where they had to complete it in um, unsegmented and segmented form. Um, we also gave them a, an adult version of the group embedded figures test. So they had to find the shape in this um, complex pattern here. So here they had to um, overcome some of the lines actually look like they're curved or they're moving. So they had to really focus on the details to actually copy that, that shape there. And we also looked at copying. So we gave them, um, <coughs> my RAs love doing this, but we um, filmed them as they were um, drawing. And then my RAs scored whether they create, they did global forms or they did local forms. Um, so global would be the overall shape. Um, local would be these kind of little buttons here, this triangle, um, this, I'm sorry, uh, diamond here, these pieces here. So did they draw look details or overall shape um, first? So we looked at, you know, what predicted children's performance on these local processing tasks. So was it IQ? Was it age? We looked at years of arts training, um, and we looked at drawing ability, um, and we found that it wasn't a, it had nothing to do with age, IQ, years <coughs> of training, um, but that the ability to draw realistically really predicted children's performance on um, the block design test, so having that ability to mentally segment the images. Um, the group embedded figures test had also predicted, so they were able to focus on the, con uh, the context and avoid, um, or avoid the context, excuse me, and focus on parts, and also on the copying test. So we found that children who were, um, had higher scores in drawing ability were more likely to copy the details first and then fill in the overall shape. Um, we also looked at whether these children had more um, autistic like traits. So what's been previously found is adults, um, non-autistic adults, who have more autistic like traits um, actually excel on these local processing tasks. So we were interested in whether our children had more um, autistic-like traits, so um, we found that it was actually restrictive. It wasn't total number of traits um, was related to drawing ability, but having restrictive repetitive behaviors and interests So this particular subscale. And if you look closer, like what this is made up of, it's made up of noticing other unusual details that others miss, which would seem very important for drawing. Um, interest, which takes a lot of time, related to that kind of rage to master and have an unusual memory for detail. So all of these seem very related to um, the ability to draw realistically, be able to capture things, um, and hold them in your memory in order to recreate that. So for this study, um, it does seem that children who are gifted in drawing these precocious realists do have superior local processing abilities. So they do share um, behavior uh, traits with uh, uh, individuals with autism. Um, they do exhibit more autistic-like traits, specifically those that seem um, related to the ability to draw, the restrictive repetitive, repetitive behaviors and interests. Um, and this drawing talent is not explained by IQ, so it seems to be something different uh, or something else that's going on here. Um, so next, so these are children, um, you know, just, you know, after school programs, these typical children, a wide range of drawing abilities. Um, so I have, I wanted to look at, you know, what kind of differentiates children who are um, drawing prodigies. Um, and so, this is working with 12 drawing prodigies, um, four boys and eight girls. And I will say this is a self-selected sample. So these are um, individuals who, when I was in graduate school, contacted my advisor <coughs> who wrote a, a book on gifted children, um, and they wanted to learn more about their children's abilities. Um, so I, it is self-selected, um, but I would say that drawing prodigies, prodigies in general are extremely rare, and drawing prodigies are even, um, I think, even rarer. So we um, invited them to be part of the study, and we did assess their drawings at a very young age to show or to assess whether they had these features, you know, occlusion, foreshortening, uh, li uh, details, line as edge at a very young age. So we did give them the um, drawing task again. So this is just a different picture of our, um, of our still life here, um, but we wanted to assess whether they indeed were um, gifted and drawing it above level at their age, and here's an example of an eight, these are a little light, but age seven and age 12, and they were, we did confirm that they are um, gifted in the ability to draw realistically. Um, we wanted to see whether they had elevated IQs, and we, uh, we 
hypothesize that you know verbal IQ would be pretty typical that maybe they had elevated non-verbal IQs. Um, so we found in terms of verbal IQ, you know, it's within about you know two thirds of standard deviation above the mean, but it seems you know the range is anywhere from 89 to 126, so pretty pretty average. Um, for non-verbal IQ, we didn't find that they had elevated um, IQs. You know, 111. Um, the range is quite broad, so 86 to 134. So this person, you know, is probably at a high end. But we're not finding that they have these really elevated um, non-verbal IQs. Um, we also gave them a bunch of perceptual tests, but we were interested in, you know, what kind of perceptual skills um, are they performing similar to adult artists or adults? Um, and so we gave them a visual memory test. And I would say with all three of these, um, I'm going to show you three perceptual tests. Um, we gave them adult versions because we wanted to make it more and more difficult. And so we compared their performance to adult norms to see whether they were similar or different. Um, so they were given this, um, this is an example, the sample, um, not the actual test, it's a little bit more difficult than this, but they had to study this pattern, uh, a bunch of patterns, and then they were asked, you know, whether the pattern was in the original um, image. Here they have to, and they have to, it had to be the exact same shape, size, orientation. So these two are actually um, in that um, pattern here. Um, we gave them a mental rotation task, so they get were presented with a target shape and had to pick which one um, or which two had been uh, mentally um, had been rotated um, and were the same. And so this is the middle two. And then finally, we gave them a visual imagery test. So which shape are the pieces of a leather soccer ball? Um, a, pentagonal and hexagonal, or hexagonal only? What do you guys think? A. Okay. A. So it is A, yeah. So they were given a series of, um, and, I, and I read these because they you know, it was 6 to 16, so I read these questions um, to the children. Um, and in terms of perceptual skills, we found that they, ha they actually their visual memory was superior to adults. So we compared the performance to adult more, they're actually scoring higher um, than adults. Um, and then in terms of mental rotation and visual imagery, they didn't differ, but they were performing at an adult-like level. I mean, considering we had, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve-year-olds, I think that's pretty, pretty great. Jennifer? Yeah. So it, when they were compared to adult, quote-unquote, regular yeah. people or adult artists? Yeah, so that's, um, so these are tasks that have been shown to, that adult artists excel at compared to, compared to non-artists. We compared them, their performance to adult norms, non-artists. Oh, so okay. this was, um, I think, <coughs> One of, I think mental rotation was a chess player's. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine the artist would perform, you know, even right. better than these um, drawing prodigies. We also looked at personality traits. So it's been shown that um, adult artists are more open to experience, and so we were interested in whether um, these children may be more open to experience. Um, we didn't find that, so we gave them a questionnaire. Parents completed a questionnaire, basically the big five. And we found that they, we compared their performance to a control group of children, and we found that they were actually more agreeable. Um, and so if you look a little bit closer at what the scale is, it's, you know, positive emotions, and so that might be related to, you know, feeling positive emotions from, you know, engaging something that they, they really enjoy. But we did not find that they were more open to experience. Um, and then finally, we looked at whether they had more autistic-like traits. So this is a, a recent book that's come out, The Prodigy's Cousin. Um, suggesting a link between um, autism and extraordinary talent. Um, and so we were interested um, in her work. Um, Ruth Setz has found that prodigies have more autistic-like traits. They have more relatives with autism. Um, so we were interested in whether that was true for our children. Um, it wasn't. So we didn't find that they had more um, autistic-like traits. I would say that in her sample, she did have three, there were eight prodigies, the study that she did with eight prodigies, and three of them had autism. So that may explain why <coughs> you know, there was discrepancy between our findings and her findings. So, um, the IQs of these drawing prodigies, they seem to be within normal range. It's not that they have elevated IQs. Um, but they do have superior perceptual skills, um, in particular um, visual memory. Um, they're more agreeable, so maybe related to, you know, experiencing positive emotions from engaging in, in drawing. Um, and they're not showing more autistic-like traits. Okay, so finally, um, I want to just talk about briefly a recent study that I did um, with child artists. Uh, and so I've really been talking about realism, but there are children who draw um, abstractly. And so, so I'll need a little audience participation here. But so the work by famous artists is perceptually or superficially similar to that of adult artists. 
Um, so one of these is made by an artist and one is made by a child. So how many people think this is made by the artist? Okay, and how many people think this one is? Some people didn't vote. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I was it's my staff says, and some people didn't vote. Um, so this one is actually made um, by the artist. And so um, what's been shown, uh, Snapper et al. showed, is that they paired images that were superficially similar, preschool artwork to famous artists, and we can detect um, which one is the famous artist at a rate above chance. We're pretty good at this. Um, and you may say, well, it's easy because they're paired together. And so they have shown this, you know, single images. We can even do it as, as single images um, when they're paired just as a single, a series of images. We can pick out the ones by the, by the artist. Now there are children who are marketed by their parents and agents as being abstract expressionist um, art prodigies. So this is Dante Long. He is the youngest professional artist, um, world record holder, um, began painting at age two, sold his first painting at age three. He has a professional website out there. Um, another example is Marla Olmsted. This is her at four, she's now 15. Um, she lives in Binghamton, New York, and it had you know, several ex ex um, ex uh, exhibits of her work. Um, the more, more recent one is Alita Andre, she's Australian. So at seven, I think two years ago, she had an exhibit in Chelsea, an art exhibit. She was written up in the Atlantic, and um, one of her works sold for $50,000. So, so, so the question is, you know, are they really, are they similar to ch child art, or are they similar to adult art? Um, and when you look at the work of adult, adult art um, abstract expressionist painters or abstract painters, um, you find that they actually do realistically as children. So it's very surprising to find these children who are just drawing abstractly and have kind of skipped over um, the realism. Um, here's an example of um, Picasso. Um, I don't remember what age this is, but he was quoted as, I've never done children's drawings, never. So he was always drawing hyper-realistically. And what you find a lot with these abstract artists is they start off drawing hyper-realistically, um, and then they kind of rebel and kind of shake things up, and then they move to drawing abstractly, or um, not drawing, but painting abstractly. So again, I was interested, you know, can we tell this difference between <coughs> abstract art? Is it similar to the work of typical children or more like um, adult artists? <laughs> so we created a series, so I'm just gonna have so you can kind of guess too, we created a series of pairs of images. Um, so this is a study done several years ago um, by members of my former lab where they took art, artists, um, art, in, uh, art by children and um, artists to look at whether we could tell the difference. And we, so we used those images and then we pulled images of these abstract art prodigies. So these are children who had professional websites and were also written up by the, um, that had like some article about them. Okay, so we created three sets of images. So we have artist, child, um, how many people think this is the artist? And then the child, or oh, I'm sorry, uh, I threw that off. This one is the artist, sorry. I'll do better on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so then we had a series of paintings. So we created one that was similar to the, the, the uh, prodigy for here, but this is another example. So then we had a set of images that was prodigy child. How many people think this was the prodigy? And how many people think this one? This one is the prodigy, good. And then we had, um, we paired artist with prodigy. <laughs> So which one, how many people think this one is the artist? And how about you about this one? Okay, this one is the, this, the, this is the artist. Um, so we had 10 uh, sets of images, so artist child, prodigy child, artist prodigy. Um, and we randomly assigned, um, we presented them as, um, uh, as pairs, and this was done on MTurk and with adults. Um, so they completed an online study and they were randomly assigned to one of these conditions. Um, and they had to identify the artist and the artist child or artists in the artist prodigy if they were in that condition. And then if they were in the prodigy child condition, we explained what a prodigy was, <coughs> and they had to select which one was by the, by the prodigy. So here we have um, our three conditions, and then we have um, percentage that it correctly identified the more skilled individual, so artists here, prodigy for the middle one, and then artists over here. And then so this is looking at, I looked at whether they were significantly different from chance. Um, and what you find is that for the artist child, we are pretty good, 70%, um, pretty good at uh, identifying the artist when it's paired with the child, child work by a child. And this replicates what's been previously done, that snapper paper. Um, for prodigy child, we are also pretty good, maybe a little less so, but we're about 62%. We're also really good at identifying the prodigy um, when they're paired with a child. And then contrary to what I hypothesized, we're really performing at chance 
um, when the artist and prodigy. We're not we're, we're having difficulty telling the difference between the two. Um, so this is probably at like 45 percent. And so I also presented and I said, well, maybe it's because you know they're paired together and it's a little bit easier um, for those you know the product for the prodigy child. And so what happens when we present them as singles? So we presented single images and again randomly assigning them to one of these conditions, artist child, prodigy child, and artist prodigy. And so, um, so you see ne negative values here. So we, I did a single detection um, analysis where I looked at you know hits and false alarms. So hits would be you know uh, classified as the artist, and then I subtracted how many times did they miss identify the child as the artist and got a, a proportion score. So if they're at zero, that means they were 50-50 performing at chance. Um, the uh, anything above. Uh, Zero would mean they're indicating they're uh, identified as the artist or the prodigy in the case of the prodigy child. Anything below would be indicating that they selected the child. So in the artist child, um, they were above, so they were correctly identifying um, the artist, and so this is looking at whether it's significantly different from chance. So they were collect, um, uh, sorry, identifying the artist um, as the artist, not misidentifying the child. Um, and then for prodigy child, they were also able to ident correctly identify the prodigy. However, and this is also contrary to what I thought, um, they were mis mislabeling the prodigies as artists. Um, so I thought they would be able to tell it, uh, tell a difference, but they didn't. They're actually giving the prodigies they felt you know that they sh they were actually artists, um, which I think was interesting. So it may be that there are two roots to um, or two roots for gifted child artists, the one being this early um, realism, early representation, and the other one being maybe this early abstraction. Um, and so there's not too many children out like, out here, uh, like this, so it'll be interesting to see as more maybe become, become, um, or can become more aware of them, uh, what happens and, and if they are, you know, can we tell the difference. Um, and then finally, I am following these children. As I said, I, we have a Facebook page where um, you know, kind of a resource for parents um, so that they can kind of, you know, have support and also um, share the drawings of their children. And so I am following these children to see, you know, do they stay realism? Do they kind of change things up? Um, and so far they seem to be pretty consistent. So this is Arkin, age four, and now he, um, it's not, a, it, it's very detailed if you go very close, but he's still, you know, creating hyper-realistic drawings. Um, this is Rocco, so he started off being really interested in nature, um, and now he's kind of switched it up and he's focused on um, political cartoons. <laughs> and he has a lot of these, um, at age 10, he's creating these. Um, here's an example of Samantha. Mm -hmm. So she actually still, um, she's now, I think 22 now, but this is when she was 20, so creating animals, a lot of portraits, Oprah Winfrey, um, Steve Jobs, so she's um, also hyper-realism. So in conclusion, it seems that um, precocious realists do share traits behaviors with individuals with autism, and that may um, explain their um, ability to draw realistically. Um, drawing prodigies, they have typical, you know, kind of normal IQs, but they do show um, superior perceptual skills, um, and contrary to what we hypothesize, they are more agreeable. It's not that they're more open to experience. And finally, there may be um, two roots of gifted child artists, this early realism and uh, early abstraction. And um, so this was work that I started in graduate school um, at Boston College in the Arts and Mind Lab, and now I am um, at Brooklyn College in the Arts and Development Lab. So um, there are many people that helped with this work that I thank, and I can answer any questions you may have. Great, that was really fascinating. All right, uh, who, who wants to go first? Brandon? Um, very interesting talk. I just came from different years, but I think this was very at the beginning, um, but I was kind of, or am kind of like one of these children, like, they do photorealistic paintings, um, and I have my own little theory about, because I, I was never formally trained uh, mm -hmm. in art until much later, um, and I have my own, like, working theory of, like, how that even developed. Uh, have you found anything with uh, birth order or anything like that, and how that makes no, I haven't. I haven't necessarily looked at birth order. Um, the children that I had, the twelve children I have, are a wide range in terms of only children, youngest child, you know, middle child, older child. Um, and I would say most of the work on drawing prodigies has been case studies, and so kind of having this collective group is something that's relatively new. It would be interesting. Are you, 
I'm an only child. You're an only child. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. No, but it's definitely a mix. Um, if, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, I do want to know, when you were younger, did you draw, were you drawing all the time? Did yeah. You're in, and super realistically? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, is there any, um, you, it seemed like a lot of these kids were drawing from memory. Um, uh, is that true both for the prodigies and the, the drawing genius? What do you the, the, the ocean's realist? The, the, the yeah. Or is there, what's the role of like copying existing drawings that already have these shortening and occlusion mm. and other things captured? Like, do they tend to do more of that? Do they not need that? That's do a really interesting. Know, yeah, that's an interesting question because you think if you're kind of copying, you know, a master's drawing, you're kind of l learning the tools, maybe some yeah. tools of the trade. Many of them are drawing from, um, you know, they've seen something, they've experienced something, and then they are using, then they're drawing it from imagination, um, or, you know, kind of from their memory. Um, and so one thing I think would also be interesting is to look at working memory, and it's been shown in a kind of a subset of just prodigies across a variety of domains that they do have better working memories, and I'm assuming that this would be the same if you looked at just a drawing prodigies. Um, but that is really interesting, because we do have them, you know, we have them look for a, at a still life and they're drawing from observation, and they're able to do that, but many times to assess their drawing abilities, but many times they're just drawing something they, they remember, and then they're, they're capturing something. Yeah. Well, sort of along those lines, I'm just wondering about, because clearly they're developing and getting better over yeah. time. And is, is it that the result of them just doing it more, essentially on their own, or are they getting training, <coughs> or are they have a better kind of, are they seeking out experiences, even if it's independent, um, that you wouldn't imagine someone else who wasn't as precocious right. as them? Like yeah. how, how are they developing their skills? And I, it's, so it's, and, and that's a question I do get is, you know, is it practice? Are they, you know, okay, kind of teasing apart the innate ability versus kind of this deliberate, you know, practice? Um, and what you see is because they're showing it so early, you would suggest like two years of age, three years of age, that it is some type of innate ability. But because they enjoy it and they have this kind of rage to master, there is a kind of a practice component there where they are, you know, they're just naturally, I, I love doing this, I want to do it all the time. But they are showing that beginning, that ability to begin with. Um, and there has been studies of children who enjoy drawing and are not very good. I don't have a, in here um, with this talk, but they don't, Im they improve a little bit, but not what you would expect just by practicing. But they do have, you know, a lot of the parents, you know, these are parents who come, they're very, you know, they want to engage and enrich their child's lives. And we, you know, a lot of times we'll suggest, you know, take them to museums, get them really, you know, uh, expo if you can't take them to museums, expose them to art books or have, you know, particular materials. So it may be that they, the, the home environment does play a role because you have these parents who are very, you know, they're recognizing, hey, something's, something's up with my child, how can I nurture and um, develop this gift? Yeah. So it is, I do, there is, yeah, there, are, there could be other components going on as well, but they are showing these abilities at, from a very young age, but that may take them down a different path because their parents are aware of it. I'm sorry, can I just follow? So yeah. you, you, do you expect it's more like these informal experiences, that is, they take, they, they provide these resources, or yeah. do you expect that they're developing through instruction, so this is not what Brandon's experience is? Yeah, like. so um, with the drawing prodigies, they don't like instruction okay. um, because they just they don't you put them in our class they're bored right. you know and a lot of times they'll say why don't if you if you want you know just let them do it on their own if you want to mm -hmm. do anything have them work with you know an, a graduate student in the art department like that's something kind of one-on-one -on -one experience but put the, putting them in like traditional art classes they just don't like right. it because they've already invented they don't need to learn the tools they've already invented ways they look at things differently so it seems to be these informal experiences yeah um, so with the the ones that draw abstractly first, yeah, do they eventually like? Can they also draw realistically when they're older? Do they can they learn that process? Or I don't. That's uh, huh? something I don't know yet. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Be, so I'm kind of. It's some of the children that uh, Marla. She's four now, 15. Mm -hmm. She's still staying with drawing very abstractly, mm -hmm. um, or painting. You know, kind of non-representational images. Um, so I'm not sure. And what you see, you know, with, mo with artists is they start off representationally yeah. and then they start, you know, kind of want to change things mm -hmm. up and rebel and then they go into abstraction. So yeah. I'm not really sure. Um, the two-year-old, we call it with all the colors, mm -hmm. where he still seems to be drawing, 
like that, like the, the abstract, scribbles yeah. and the colors, yeah. Okay. So it'll be interesting to see as they develop. <coughs> and two questions. Could actual artists tell the difference between artists and prodigies? Um, they could, t I don't know. So I don't know that question. That's a really good one to look at. I know that that study with artists and child was done with non-art and art students, and uh, they were both able, they performed equally as well. Um, there was no difference, but I don't know about the artist. That would be an interesting question, the artist prodigy. And the other question yeah. is, are there any differences between um, the prodigies in art and like other child prodigies? Um, so that also has not really been studied. In what sense? What in what sense? Do you mean like for just instance, agreeableness. Uh, are people who are good at math and music ag more agreeable than the norm? I don't know. I mean, that's an excellent question. I think what's been done, uh, what's been really studied is, you know, kind of these case studies. And um, Joanna Rootstadt, who's at OSU, she's starting to have like a group of music and drawing and art uh, uh, and uh, math prodigy. So maybe she'll have more as her research progresses, know a little bit more about that, but that would be really interesting to see. But math people are, are more variable. Yeah, yeah, right. I was yeah. going to say, yeah. <laughs> but if there's certain things they have in common versus not, yeah. Uh, this is really fascinating. So I'm, I'm interested in um, unpacking some of the, the variables. That, you know, right now it's a little bit coarse, right? You right. know, like at the big five and, <laughs> you know, sort of spatial skills yeah. or whatever. So, um, you know, I have a whole set of eye trackers, so one of the things I might be oh, interested yeah. in doing is looking at kids in terms of these prodigies. You know, when they're looking at something, what are they looking at? And, you know, are they scanning it overall mm -hmm. versus the ASD kids who right. are probably very fixated on one? You know, because it's representation, right? In order to produce something, you need to represent it. In order to represent it, you need to have understood it. In order to understand it, you're going to scan it in a certain way. Your right. knowledge acquisition yeah. pattern might be very different. That's an interesting so, um, yeah. I have a proposal idea for you, and I own a whole set of eye trackers. So. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. <laughs> I was just, uh, um, a colleague just gave a talk at an in-house conference yesterday, and someone brought this up. He was our work. We do work on artists and non-artists, and someone also brought this up, like eye tracking. Right. What are they looking at? Because we know with autistics, right, mm -hmm. when they're looking at scenes of, uh, you know, um, interactions mm -hmm. of people. They don't focus on the same things that quote unquote normals right. do, right? Where they look at the eyes, they look at the mm -hmm. mouth, they look at things that are going to be able to allow them to understand the emotion and the emotional interaction. That would be really interesting. So, um, yeah. you know, we know this about autistics. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, it would be very interesting where they have this very specialized skill if they're focusing on the details and to, to unpack sort of oh, this yeah. sort of, you know, mystical thing of are, are, are all prodigies just autistic or all autistics prodigies, you know what I mean? There's exactly. big yeah. the boiler circles there that I'd like to unpack. And even what the difference between, you know, autistic versus prodigy versus, you know, yeah. non-autistic, non-prodigy. Right. Because maybe then the non-prodigy, non-autistic just scan overall and maybe the prodigy scan and then they decide, okay, I'm going to focus on this particular right. aspect and then they... And then the, also the, the extent to which... Um, you know, so you know my work, my earlier work was with architects and, and right. drawings, yes. and so I've worked a lot with drawings and students' drawings, and you know, the extent to which the paper and the, the image that's being created is a dialectic with what's in the mind, right? Mm. So in, in these kids, you could maybe get them thinking aloud, but then that's an artifact and it creates, you know, different drawing experience perhaps, but there's some really interesting potential study there with think alouds as well. Right, and what are they, yeah. What are they focusing, focusing on? on? How are they articulating mm -hmm. it, et cetera? So. No, that would be really interesting. Yeah. I know, yeah. We all like to talk I know, about. right. <laughs> Anything else? It might be off topic. No. Um, so <laughs> this, this is the famous saying, uh, ontogeny recapit recapitulates phylogeny. This the idea that as we evolve, or as we develop as individual organisms, we sort of redo the history of evolution. And so I'd be interested to see, y you clearly are interacting with art historians, <coughs> but thinking about it not just as individual artist development, but also oh. the disciplines. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, because of the job posting I saw recently, do you have any thoughts about the sort of, uh, do you know what seam versus yeah. Um, do you have yeah. thoughts about that? Um, well, <laughs> that is, so I am, uh, so uh, how I, I met Janice is that I'm really, I am interested in how drawing can enhance 
learning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think there's a lot of potential of how, you know, how are we focusing? Are we focusing on certain um, observational features or how we are able to abstract information and create it into a pict pictorial form? And hyper-realism. Right, and right. hyper-realism. <laughs> and so, I, you know, and I think there's a lot, a lot that can be particularly done in that um, area and maybe even giving uh, children